here. Hello. Good evening. Please, we'll be starting soon. So let's uh, wait for some few, a couple of minutes for others to join. I don't, I'm not sure. Maybe, Connor, you can start. Maybe in case anybody others can join us later. Okay. Sounds good. Let me uh, pull my screen up here. So we can scrub this through these together. I think um, nothing really stood out to me as uh, very complicated. But um, yeah, I had some. Our markdown problems. Um, I guess the book hasn't been updated in a while. Um, so all my formatting got messed up, but um, that's fine. Um, okay. So. All right, we're starting.
Okay. Um, all right. So these are just some quick examples of of um, problems that you could solve with statistics um, or machine learning, depending on your perspective. Um, so just going over the basics. Um, I'm not sure I go over all of them or just the ones that, that were interesting to me. I think we can briefly discuss all of them. I had one question about uh, part D in question one. Okay. Um, okay, so yeah, we'll, we'll just go through them and hit questions as we go, I guess. Um, so if your sample size is very large and your predictor set is small, then a, a, I think a more flexible model would pick up more of the signal and the underlying data and the underlying pattern. Um, but again, with, with, with a lot of these, like there's, it's pretty vague. So yeah, I can see arguing both ways on some of this. Um, B, if your predictors, if you have a lot of predictors, but uh, only a small population in your N, um, then yeah, if, you, if your N is small, then a parametric method is probably better because it's making stronger assumptions about the shape of the data. Um, but you need to reduce the number of predictors because if you're gonna, if you're, if you have too many, too many degrees of freedom in your parametric model on a small sample size, then um, the model will start having problems. So uh, the, the person that previously worked on this um, exercise booklet said to use um, principal, principal component analysis, um, which is, I think that's correct. I changed it to two dimension reduction, uh, just in case there's some kind of, some, some categorical variables in there. Uh, but the idea is that you want to reduce the number of predictors and then fit your model on that on that reduced dimension space. Mm -hmm. Um, if the relationship is highly nonlinear, then you need a, um, flexible model would, would handle the, that relationship without, you know, being told you could do it with a inflexible model with, with like a progression with splines or something to try and coerce that non-linearity, um, but you know, that's probably not gonna do as well as a more flexible model. Um, so I think if the, if the data set has high variance, then you, I think I agree with this answer that was in, the, in there previously that you wanna take a more, a function that, that makes stronger assumptions and it'll slice through the domain, as they say. Um, whereas if you take a flexible model on a on some data that's ha that has a lot of variance, the flexible model might pick up noise and confuse it with signal. I don't understand what average slice across the domain means. Um, like just creating a straight line through the points instead of trying to to fit a to fit you know some curve through it. Okay, okay. The average slice is at that line. Okay. Yeah. Um. So for these, and just a couple examples to work through. Um. So if you have 500 firms, then your N is 500 and you've got three predictors and then your um, target variable because the target variables is the CEO salary. So then you have three others besides that. 
um, new product launch. So your your N is twenty there, and then you have three predictors plus ten, and then you have your target variable, which is success or failure. Um, so that's binary classification. Um, the next one, it's a percent chain, so that's regression. Um, and you have three predictors, and assuming that there's 52 weeks in the year, then the end is 52. Um, I, I kept this graph in from the previous um, club. Um, so the, the black line is the um, the Bayes error. So that's the that's the that puts the ceiling on the on your accuracy for the model. Um, and then blue is the bias, brown is the variance. That's your bias variance trade off. Yellow is the training set, so that always decreases as you get more flexible, but there's diminishing returns. And then green is the test set error, and that's where you see that U shape. So as the model becomes more flexible, it drives the training error down, but then it overfits and increases the, the test error. I guess you changed the yellow, the word yellow to actual yellow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, green. I saw that <laughs> and that uh, bugged me, so I changed it. Um, okay. So some real life applications. Um, these are some things that I've either done for work or thought about doing for work. Um, but for classification, you could do you know, inference on customer service interaction if the interaction was a failure or success. And you could use some natural language processing to process the, the phone call transcript or email transcript or whatever. Um, use metadata about the customer and the customer's order to try and figure out why certain characteristics led to a successful interaction, um, predict whether a customer order will be returned or not. Um, so that's an again classification, but we're more interested in the accuracy there. Prediction, um, so you could use information about the product, about the customer and the order process. So maybe the, at so, some point in the warehouse, there's a mistake and the wrong product being gets put in the box. And then that creates the return, you know. Um, banking fraud is a classic one. Um, is it fraudulent or not? Um, so that's more you're interested in the accuracy of the prediction. Um, so the transfer amount, the customer transfer history, and other metadata about the transfer. Um, Regression, or I guess I'll stop there. Did they want, you don't have any other ideas about classification? Mm, not on the top of my head. I haven't seen it yet. All right. Um, regression. So, consumer demand. Is a classic one. So, how much our customers going to buy? Um, so, you could look at how much customers have bought in the past, and then you know, macroeconomic indicators such as consumer spending, um, and then things like marketing. So, is it was, was there a big advertising campaign? Was there a discount? Were there other incentives being offered? Um, lead time for imports. So if your company imports materials and then processes those to sell to uh, the, the, the end consumer, then the co company wants to know how long it will take in, to get the product from the source 
to your, your car house or um, manufacturing facility. So, um, cause that's important for the logistics. Um, so you could use the type of material or the source of the materials, the type of materials, the shipping method, and maybe weather is a, is a, a thing. Um, like the Suez Canal has been suffering a drought recently, so they've had to reduce the throughput there, which is impacting the supply chain. Um, and then predict demand for a new product. So this is where you don't have any any demand history for that specific you know, product SKU. Um, so you could look at similar products that were launched in the past, and then maybe information about the customer, or the you know information about them or, or how they're buying the product. Any ideas on on progression? Yeah, in my field in transportation, we predict traffic volume, uh, so that those are numbers and um, speed of cars. So yeah, that would be a regression problem. Okay, so for my own experience, I think I would like to relate it uh, to area in which I've worked on, like in the agricultural sector, uh, we can we can spread, predict uh, maybe like the tree height, tree volume, uh, the starch root starch content of uh, maybe like cassava, which is the current uh, crop we are working on, which I can say is like a regression problem. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. Um, so clustering, which is non-supervised or unsupervised learning. Um, so you could you know cluster customers. That's that's a classic one, based on customer attributes and purchasing history and things like that. Um, in manufacturing, you could look at operating data about the machines, um, and look at ways to cluster them. So you could. Uh, more efficiently maintain them, you know, assign mechanics and things like that. Or if, you know, certain ones break down more frequently, then that might end up in a different cluster. And those are special. Um, then one, um, you could cluster like city areas, like city blocks or neighborhoods by the amount of um, various citizen complaints or requests. So like in Pittsburgh here, we get a lot of um, snow complaints if the snowplow doesn't come on time in the morning. Um, but then you also get some in interesting things like in the summer. Um, so there's tons of different categories there, but you could cluster the, the, the geographies by the quantity of the requests that they get for each category and then assign city workers to, to, to those clusters. Um, that changes over time, but still would be sort of an interesting problem. Any in other this, ideas on clustering? In this uh, city, 311 complaints clustering example, mm -hmm. um, if you look at location, they're already clustered by location. So if we look at light and lawn of uh, mm -hmm. complaints, um, what else could be used to uh, cluster them? So let's say there are some number of garbage, no removal complaints, and we already know light and lawn. So are only the location coordinates used for clustering here, or could we use those other number of complaints, like uh, number of garbage complaints and so on. For I think also. for this example, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use the location as, as an, as input to the cluster. Um, because that that's already how cities are organized. Yeah. That wouldn't tell us anything new. Right. So if you cluster only on the number of garbage complaints or pothole complaints or snow complaints, or and, 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 you know, 
Mm. Say, say, say you have 20 different complaint types. You could cluster on those and say, okay, even, even though these two areas are, are next to each other, they have different patterns of, of complaints. Mm. So they should get different resources. Yeah, got it. Um, so advantages and disadvantages um, of flexible versus inflexible models. Um, so the more flexible ones just need more data, uh, a lot more data. Like you can do a putting a model with you know twenty observations, um, but if you want to do gradient boosting or deep learning, then you need thousands at least probably. Um, the more flexible ones are also more likely to overfit on the training data, so you got to be careful and, and make sure that you're looking at the test error. Um, and then depending on the industry, um, some companies might prefer simpler models that they can explain because they might need to explain it for regulatory reasons. Any other uh, comments on those? I'm just wondering with neural nets, for example, uh, when we have lots of data, uh, what's still stopping the nets to not overfit? Well, there's still the, that risk, right? I mean, there's there's a risk of overfitting on any model, flexible or inflexible. Um, but with the more flexible ones, there's a lot more of that risk, mm -hmm. even if you have a lot of data. Um, so you you have to... And that's where we get, like, I guess later in the book, you get some cross-validation and things like that, where you do multiple train and test sets. And then you fit one model structure on all those, those cross-validation folds and look at the test error. And if the test error is always high, too high, then the model, the model is overfitting and you need to, need to consider a different um, model structure. So there's, there's no way to know if it's going to overfit until you until you fit it and, and, and look at the, that test error. Um, so non-parametric versus parametric. So parametric is is making a stronger assumption about the pattern shape of the, of the data. Um, I thought this was interesting is that you need less data if it's a parametric model, which I guess makes sense because you're making very strong assumptions about, about the, the, the pattern in the data. So you're almost like backfilling the model with information from outside of the observations. Whereas with non-parametric, it's only looking at the observations and not assuming any specific shape. Um, so this is the Euclidean, Euclidean distance for for K nearest neighbors. Um, I mean that's just the calculation. Um, so this was the classification example where they're using the voting of the classes, right? So if there is red, red, and green, then because red is the most common, that is the class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's looking at the conditional probability mm -hmm. of the class based on the K that, that it's looking at. Um, so if, if the number of, if the, if the number of K is small, then it will take, it could take more nonlinear fits around the data. So if, if that's the true shape of the data, then that's good. Um, but, it, but then it, it, it might mistake this, the, 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 the noise for signal. Um, whereas if you, 
have a large K, then it's more like a straight line classifier. Um, so this is the, the applied section with the college data set. Um, were there any questions about the code on this section? No, I didn't have any questions about that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty pretty straightforward. I thought you could just apply some of the basic functions to the data set, look at the output. Um, I messed up the formatting on some of my um, markdown here, so that, that's why it looks funny. Um, but this is always a cool way to look at data. You know, if you have a lot of predictors, then you can just look at all the possible combinations of color plots mm -hmm. and uh, histograms. Um, so the, this is just a box plot of private versus out of state. Um, so because private is a factor, um, it treats that as categorical in GG plot. Um, so this is how you bin something like that in dplyr with mutate. So if the value is above 50, then it's yes. If not, then no. And then you turn that into a factor. So this also gives a nice uh, idea of how to go from a regression problem to a classification problem. Now we can predict top 10% if we want to. Mm, right, yeah, you can, you can turn it around. Here's the box plot of elite versus versus out of state. Um, again, same idea, turn it into a factor, and uh, make a box plot out of, out of that continuous data. Um, so I just use the bins function here in GM histogram. So this one, this one has ten bins, and this one has forty. So you can see it just breaks breaks down the bars into smaller and smaller bins as you change that. Um, so again, we just look at the data, um, look at the various directions between. Um, so I found like things like this where it's nonlinear, almost like a hockey stick effect. Um, so I think, but blue is not private, right? Like if I'm looking at that right. So the number of PhDs versus um, the expenditure. So that's a, a not interesting nonlinear relationship. And again, with that, but with that terminal variable too. But there's a lot of overlap in some of these, so. That'd be an inter interesting modeling problem. All right, the auto data set um, skim is a great function. Um, it's a little more readable than summary. Uh, so it breaks down our data, gives a summary of the types and the rows, um, and then it shows the summary of each variable. So these are all factor variables. These are our numeric variables with, with some summary stats for each one. Um, so this just uses um, summarize and range to calculate that. Um, so then we get our min max of each. Same idea for standard deviation and mean. So you just summarize across everything after that select and take the mean. And we get our mean column and same with standard deviation. 
we just apply that function to all the columns and pivot longer. Any questions on, on that stuff? In terms of code, I think we can also just combine mean and SD in the same summarize line. Yeah, yeah, you could. Yeah, you could just have two separate columns for that. So have the name and then SD and then mean for sure. Um, so here you can subset the data. So removing rows 10 through 85. Um, you could also do this with like slice in dplyr. You can feed slice a uh, the index with the with minus sign in front of it, it'll do the same thing. Um, so again, just to find the range for me and standard. And you could, you could do this all in one go as well, you know, just do um, range and SD and mean, put it all on the table. Here I, I, I use reframe because that's, that's the new function to use instead of summarize. It changed that like last year or something. Um, because range will return, I think, but returns two values. So summarize wants to condense the rows, so you have one distinct row per grouping variable. Yeah, but range gives you two values, so summarize gets a little mad at you. So if if you expect more than one more than one value per group, then, then use reframe. And that's why it was giving me that warning up, up ahead, up, up top here. Oh, across what, as well. uh, yeah. Donna, yeah, what a time, side, you would, I am always confused the difference uh, between that summarize and reframe. Because at times I use summarize, I just get a error message that I should switch to reframe at times. I used to be I don't know if anybody have thoughts. When should we do reframe? When should we use summarize? Yeah, so it, I mean, it's a warning, so it's not an error. Um, so it still works. Um, but yeah, so I think range is a good example because because range will, it takes a vector, right? And returns two values. Whereas mean takes a vector and returns one value. So summarize always expects one, one value per distinct grouping you know, ID, right? So summarize works with mean because mean returns one value. But summarize will, will show a warning with range because it returns two values. So then you have two rows per ID. So if, if you expect more than one row per ID, then use reframe. It's it's basically copy and paste the, the difference to the programmers, you know, invisible basically. But I think I think they're gonna make a like a I think that they're gonna make summarize not work with those functions maybe like in two years, but they're pointing that warning out now to get people to move away. So that's just our range center deviation of mean. Um, so again, same old idea, look at the all the pairwise scatter plots and histograms of the variables. Um, I added a argument here. So I made, uh, I changed the alpha on the points. So the alpha is 0.1 so that they're not so over plotted. So you can see the, the clumps where there's more dots than, than others. That's something I do pretty often in my EDA. Um, if you have a ton of points, then I would use something like Geome um, Density 2D or Geome um, 
bin X, I think, or bin 2D, either way, but there's ways of calculating the density of the observations um, as opposed to just drawing one point for every observation and overplotting so you can't see anything. But again, you got a lot of nonlinear relationships here. Um, this one's a little heteroscedastic. These are more or less linear. And there's like a knot here where there's a step change, which is interesting. Displacement and horsepower. I have a question about multiple uh, independent variables. So in a model, uh, for example, here, if we have some variables that are clearly non-linearly related to the uh, dependent variable, but could it be possible that when we look at multiple independent variables, then the relationship with uh, dependent variable is linear? Sure, yeah. That's something that you, that you can't really know until you try it, in, in, until you test it. You know, so you could try, you know, some some like a multivariate regression model with just the the combinations of the variables, but then also try one where there's a uh, you could you could take the square or the square root, or use use a spline somehow. And test if that transformation gives you lower test error. Mm -hmm. So that's just a key you've got an experiment there. But yeah, it's an interesting question. If you if you're if the relationship is nonlinear, just looking at two variables, but then if you add three, is that relationship between the first two still not nonlinear? That's that's hard. It's hard to, to judge based on just based on a graph, right? Yeah. So, so that's just you know experimentation. Um, Boston data set. So I I, I was, um, and I think I might, I might make a PR into the main book for this, um, but there's there's some very questionable. Um, Choices being made in the original data set here. Um, if you read around on the original study from this, I think it was 1976 or something, and they, they made a um, assumption that there's a like a parabolic relationship between um, the amount of black people in the in the suburb um, and the median value. Um, I might be butchering that, but it's like I, I uh, um, these links are interest, interesting to read. Um, just just a, a, a another example of you know there's no um, there's a, no such thing as unbiased data. Like you should always go back to the source and look at it because you know okay it's a, it's a data frame in R like that's just the data, but there's there's choices going into into how the data was made. Um, so just something to read. Um, so again, we're just pulling in the Boston data set, but just finding the dimensions, pretty straightforward. Um, so again, we're looking at the median value of homes in suburbs in Boston. Um, so again, we have, we have a lot of interesting relationships here, some are that's that's very interesting right there. It's like a very spliny looking line there, curve. Um, so, you know, if you're trying to model meaning value, you'd have to look at a fair amount of these for sure. So it looks like room is the big is the big one and people the number of people in in, in, in lower socioeconomic status is a, is a big uh indicator there and some of these are just kind of weird looking but they might look different if you control for some other variables at the same time uh 
Um, so looking at crime rate, you just you can use slice max to find the top three by crime in ascending order. Um, like a histogram, you know, all, all stuff we've already seen before in the other examples. So it's highly skewed to the right. You see that a lot in this data set. Um, so the, I think tax is the, the tax rate. So um, I'd probably say this is actually bimodal. It's not skewed. Like there's two distinct distributions. So maybe instead of just using tax as a continuous variable, you might even um, turn it into, into like bins or somehow turn it into a discrete variable. Because there's a, you know, I think these are like different populations basically. So it might be hard for a model to, to find the pattern when the distribution is this weird. Um, PT ratio is, what was that? Um, I forget what that was. Pupil teacher, that's right. That was parent teacher, pupil teacher. Um, so student, student to teacher ratio. Um, so again, that's the bottom three. And again, skewed left here. So here count is um, evaluating this logical expression. So is this variable equal to the in, in, equal to one here? And then counting on this, the, the, the true false output. Um, so what's the median ratio? Again, pretty straightforward. What's the Lowest. So just filter on the min there. And there's a tie, right? So it shows both rows. It's not going to find the first row that meets that condition. It shows all the rows that meet that condition. Um, and then looking at those two rows, this is a cool chart um, that someone in the previous book club did that finds those those two at the bottom and um, makes those a different color. So you can see that there, the homes there are older, higher crime rate, close to, to the other um, job centers higher than average industry, I think, or some other, you know, but, you know, interesting way to look at that pattern. Um, so here, if you want to find the tracks with um, more than seven or eight rooms, you can do that with case when, and then count on that new variable. So these seven to eight are included, or no, the, the, so these are, these are exclusive, right? Yeah, exclusive. Um, and then just looking at the scatter plots with those highlighted. That was it. Are there, were there any any other questions on that on those exercises? Yeah, for me, I am fine. I thank you very much uh, for taking us through this uh, chapter uh, today. I think still maybe I still.